I, I was looking into the flame the other day and realized, you know, for 3,000 years, people who had actually experienced glass and, and, and have the relationship like you were just talking about with glass, just you, you can just imagine how many dreams in 3,000 years just that glass has gave people. And it's, if, you, if you really are close to glass and you really explore that and you think about it, it's, it's pretty fascinating. This is the Wise Guy Radio Show, a podcast dedicated to educating and inspiring through conversations with today's top talents in the world of glass. We will be dissecting their journeys in hopes to deliver actionable content that you, the artist, can start implementing now, helping you grow not only as a creative spirit, but also a successful artistic entrepreneur. With a little organization, relationship building, and your artistic ability, you can obtain greatness. Climb aboard, whether an artist, retail owner, or enthusiast. We have a ton of fun in store for you. Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show. Hey, 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 what's happening? Welcome to the Wise Guy Radio Show, episode number 177. This is your host, Jason Michael, and thank you so much for tuning in today. Today's guest is Eli Maze, and he is one of three brothers who are artists and uh, are commonly known in our industry. And Eli has stepped aside and has done his own thing and uh, has made a name for himself with shot glasses. And uh, he's got several things coming out and has previously pu- published a book uh, called The Contemporary Shot Glass and is right now in the middle of uh, putting one together called The American Shot Glass. And it's really a story about the history of the shot glass. It's pretty cool. And him and I get into a lot of that in the conversation here. I don't want to give too much away. Uh, but definitely had a lot of fun talking to him. Uh, we have a lot of behind the scenes uh, things we were talking about before we actually hit record uh, of some projects that him and I are going to work on together as well, which I'm super excited about for the community for glass and the history of glass. Um, I'm a big history buff and nerd myself, and he is as well, which you'll hear in the passion and what he talks about. Uh, it's pretty cool stuff. And my voice is shot right now, so I want to do my intro too long. Had a long day. We're at the mouse house making pumpkins and hanging out and talking to guests and now it's about 10 o'clock at night here, Eastern, and I'm fucking pooped. Uh, but some fun stuff is I got my uh, my buddy Chris Dickey's in town. Him and his wife Scott in town tonight from Texas. He'll be over at Champs uh, this weekend for the trade show. So anybody in Florida listening to this episode, this is coming out live Friday. Uh, I'm actually going to be there on Sunday with him uh, until we close up, and I'm going to help him break the shop down. Uh, if you guys or gals are going to be at Champs in Orlando, definitely come by, say hey. Um, I don't know his booth number off the top of my head. But uh, when I post up the episode, I'll put the booth number uh, on the link as well, and I'm going to promote his stuff too in the meantime. Um, But yeah, so him and I are going to do a little live episode from Champs, which is pretty exciting. And if you're out about, come by and shake some hands. Love to meet you and see you in person and also get you on the show too. We're going to be all set up for recording, so come by and say hey. And uh, yeah, so don't forget to go see Mountain Glass and all of our fun sponsors out there, the Flow Magazine, uh, Glass Roots still on board. We've got uh, 2018 ramping up and we've got some fun, exciting ideas that's going to be going down the hatch for those cats as they continue to fine-tune that uh, that trade show with all the classes that they're offering and seminars and workshops and just a fun environment, the whole nine yards. So uh, going to be bringing Chris Piazza back on as well uh, for our second year of him after his Glass Roots show to talk about the success and failures and Uh, all the stuff that he learned this year from doing a trade show because we know trade shows are uh, part of the way of our community of how a lot of us make money myself personally i don't but i know a lot of you do out there listening to this uh, do the trade shows and the workshops and whether it's a trade show for pipes or a trade show for beads and pendants and uh, sculptures and stuff it's all the same conversation because it's selling your work and how to be the most successful artist out there when it comes to marketing and selling and displaying and pricing and all that fun shit uh, so and that being said on pricing this one more little side topic here I'm gonna do, be doing a whole episode here on pricing work uh, not that I'm gonna su- give suggestions on it but I do definitely want to have the conversation on price and what we should be selling our stuff for uh, to me the the pipe, the production pipe, is not the art of what we do. It's our production. It's our bread and butters. And there should be a standardization of pricing across the board, no matter where the fuck you live. And I get prices do change ups and downs based on economy and demographics, etc. However, um, the show won't be about at all about how to price your headpieces. It's going to be all about the concepts of pricing production stuff, whether it's a handpipe, a chillum, a Sherlock, a standard bubbler, you know, wrap and rakes. Going to be talking about all that stuff from different techniques 
um, how to figure out baseline calculations, which I've done in the past, all that kind of business talk. I have, I'm ready to get back into the business chats here on the show, and it's, I think it's needed, uh, especially right t- now in this kind of weird space that we are in this industry where some of the most successful artists that we've had in our community are struggling right now, and it's pretty fucking weird, and it shouldn't be. And I know there's fads and trends and whatever, but it's just kind of a weird dichotomy right now going down. So with that being said, I'm going to get the fuck out of here. Uh, if you have not yet subscribed to this podcast and you have an iPhone, all you have to do is go find Wise Guy Radio on your iTunes app. Subscribe to the show, download these episodes, and you can also now leave a rating and review right on the freaking app, which is pretty cool. I'm not a fan of how this app is working right now. I'm not sure how you feel about it, but I don't really like this new layout that they have for it. But it is nice that you can now... Uh, leave a review on there, at least a five-star review if you feel the show deserves it. Uh, if you have an Android phone or one of the Google phones out there, you can go on uh, to the App Store and find any kind of podcast catcher. A uh, common one is uh, called Stitcher. You can also listen to the show on iHeartRadio, uh, TuneIn Radio. We're all over the damn place. Or you can just go to wiseguymedia.com and find our shows all there as well. So definitely hook us up with some subscriptions and some love on there out in the cyberspace. And uh, I haven't done a newsletter in forever. I, I've written a couple, several of them and have not sent them out. And i uh, got to get to a point where I'm going to get myself back on this groove. So um, if you want to get signed up for our newsletter, uh, which will definitely be coming out here very shortly, uh, you can go to wiseguymedia.com and look where it says subscribe. And you can subscribe to the newsletter there. A little pop-up comes up as well. So there you go. That being said, I'm getting the fuck out of here. Love you. Have a beautiful night, beautiful day, morning, whatever the hell time of year, day, week, month it is you're listening to this. And happy Milton. And if you're not a glass artist, thanks for listening. Anyways, I appreciate your enthusiasm and I appreciate anybody and everybody who listens to this show because the world of glass is fucking amazing. Yeah, I do. I love it. I'm sure you do too. So until next time, enjoy this episode with Eli Maze. Episode 177 of the Wise Guy Radio Show. We will talk to you soon. Hey, what's up, Eli? Welcome to the show. Hey, what's going on? I'm glad to be here. I'm stoked. Yeah, dude, me too. It's uh, It's been a long time coming, and I'm glad we were able to work our timings out and scheduling and shit. I know we're both busy as hell, so thanks again for uh, putting some time aside for the show. Oh, yeah. I'm, I'm excited. I'm, I'm glad to tell everybody about this uh, exciting uh, American shot glass. Yeah, I'm ready to hear about it myself. The so. American. Yeah. So yeah, you know, um, what happened was, is that I was trained by a Walt Disney glassblower. My older brother was uh, a glassblower at JBD, which a lot of people know, Jerome Baker Design. And uh, yeah, and I have another brother, and we've we've been blowing glass together since about 1999. Um, We started a little art studio. I made a lot of collectibles through the years. And so I traveled, what happened was I, I traveled all across the country doing different shows I would go to Tucson, Kansas, Philadelphia, um, you know, California, just all over the, the country, a, a lot of shows in Las Vegas. And as I did these shows, I started to realize making all these collectibles from frogs to, um, you know, little lizards to marbles, beads, pendants, pipes. I had never met a shot glass maker. You know, I had met people who made one or two shot glasses or Maybe they maybe they went through maybe a small phase, like for a couple months, maybe they made shot glasses, but never once did I go to a booth and, and it was like, dude, this is the shot glass guy. It's so true. I've never seen that myself. I know like I made them for a couple months during Operation Pipe Dreams, but you know, yeah. until my pipe demand came back again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so so what do we do as artists? We always look around, even when we're making pieces and we say we're so much alike and that's a great thing because we all love glass and we have all these commonalities that we love to do together, but we all, it's kind of catch 22. We're always trying to separate ourselves from the pack. That's what they call unique. And so immediately I knew I had something. I was like, I was actually with Abe from North star, Abe Fleischman. And I started talking to him and I said, Hey, have you ever met a shot glass maker? 
uh, I had to reconfirm this thought right away. And then I was with Lewis Wilson too. This is the Walt Disney glass blower you guys are aware of. And I, and I had to ask him too, a guy who'd been blowing glass for almost 40 years, had he ever met a shot glass maker? And he was actually at the show when I came up with this, you could say this epiphany. And so I ran to them both and they were both stunned. You know, they were, you know, Lewis Wilson could, was just like, wow, he just about fell off his chair. And then me and Abe sat there, you know, for a little while, we were trying to come up of Nate with, with people who made shot glasses or, or how they made all these shot glasses. We started to think, well, how do they make all these shot glasses? And we thought, well, it must be a lathe, you know, they, they must be making them on a lathe. And so, so either way, um, what happened was I, I got with North star. We North star put up $10,000 and gave me a budget to buy uh, the top 40 glass uh, uh, shot glasses from some of the top glass artists in the country. Hell yeah. And so it was, um, yeah. And so, so he, Abe helped me pick a bunch of these guys out. You know, I had been selling shot glasses prior to that for about six years. I mean, I also kind of identified at one time uh, how it really, you know, how, how it got started uh, before I even came up with us this, this, oh, I've never met a shot glass maker. I was making shot glasses in about 2006 at a show in Las Vegas. I had noticed that no one made shot glasses, and I was in Las Vegas at the oldest glass show in the country. It was it's called the Glass Bead Expo. Yeah, Snodgrass, uh, Bob, uh, Bob Snodgrass took me out there years ago and said, "Eli, you have to come out to the oldest glass show in the country. 250 classes in glass." And so I went out there. I did the show for a while, and I couldn't believe that nobody had shot glasses in Las Vegas. So that was hmm. kind of the start of, you know, and so what did I do? I, I set out. I made shot glasses. I told people about them. Um, I got with uh, artists from Darby, once again, Snodgrass, to um, Josh McDaniels, Tim Dreyer, Marcel Braun Salt. Uh, I had John Bridges. Um, Anthony Charles, Nady Biskin, uh, just just a numerous Her, uh, Harold Williams Cooney, Mente, Sack, uh, Hacky Sack, um, just Road Dog, just a whole bunch of Jared DeLong. Uh, they all agreed, all these guys, to do a glass to you know create a movement in glass to bring back the shot, the handmade shot glass, mm -hmm. and what I found. And what I found out from doing more and more research, I really like, I started to dive into this thing once I found out about all this. And uh, I got a hold of the Corning Museum. Um, I got a hold of a guy named Mark J. Pigfit, and he wrote three sh books on shot glasses. Hmm. And I found out, yeah, well, well, so now we have to ask why. Yeah. You know, yeah. now we go into the question like, well, why? Okay. Well, I did a bunch of research when I got home. I found out finally, I'm not kidding you. It after I had this book, like pretty much dreamed up and imagined, it took me six months. And this is where Mike Souza is going to come up here in a second. It took me six months to, and Abe Fleisch, Fleischman, he, he can figure it out. How did they make these shot glasses? You'd think, oh, it'd just be easy. We all know. I mean, yeah, everybody knows subconsciously it was a machine, but I dove into it. I found out they made a bottle machine in 1903. It would make 243 bottles every minute. Whoa. It sh uh, it, and then uh, that was by a guy named Michael Owens. Um, in 1926, they blow by that corning. A guy named William Wood makes a machine that makes 400,000 light bulbs every 24 hours. Holy shit. It's <laughs> crazy. And no one's ever inspired to make a shot glass again. Prohibition passes in 1933. The machine starts making a half a million shot glasses every 24 hours. They use it for advertisement. And then, you know, and I'm, I'm still going on the first book. Sometimes it's hard for me not to jump into the next the next project because it's it, it has become a, a big project. But yeah, so the so the first book, almost selling 2000 copies and going on tour with it and really telling people about the history of the shot glass. So so one other thing here. So so the and going to the to the topic and, and all the stuff that's covered in the 
first book, The Contemporary Shot Glass, is I found out that there was a little bit of trivia in this story that they I found out I after talking to uh, a professor in Michigan who was an author of the, of the three books, Mark Pickfit, that they didn't know why it was called a shot glass. Hmm. And it just it opened. It, it really did, man. It, uh, it's cool. It opened up a whole new can of worms. I knew. OK, I found out. I don't know why it's called a shot glass. Um, I, I, I don't know why people don't make them. Well, we found out about this machine. So you found out about the glass industry, uh, the revolution of the, the glass industrial glass revolution. And then, um, you, you tell this story about bringing back handmade shot glasses. And so, um, you know, they, they thought that the shot glass originally might've been called the shot glass because when they would go out and hunt with their shotgun, they would come home, they would eat meat, there would be little buckshot in the meat, and they would spit it in a little glass. <laughs> Makes total and fucking then, sense. <laughs> yeah, and so so that was one theory. That's and then so another funny. theory was, you know, the, a lot of people have heard this too, they would set a cartridge of bullets in the Old West up on a bar, and you would give some sh- shots, some bullets, for a shot, uh, a shot of whiskey. Huh. Okay, some... There's there's this idea of a shot, like when you shoot somebody, a shot is a powerful moment, and so is a shot of whiskey. Um, one that I like, yeah, it me still too. Gives me chill. Yeah, the one that I like the best, it still gives me chills to this day, and I'll tell you why. Is that there was a guy named Frederick Otto Shot. He invented borosilicate glass. He invented high-fired glass. He was from Geneva. And he also had a, a hand in helping make possible the very first oil lamp. Hmm. Um, they think that maybe he was, uh, he was a scientist, but they think ob- obvious shot. They thought that maybe he made little shot glasses or his factory at one time now. If you ever buy glass and you get a case of glass and it says shot on it, that's the guy Otto Frederick shot. So he's 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 you know I and and the funny thing is about this story that's coincidental is that I use shot to make my shot glasses before I even knew this story. Yeah, it's funny, but see, so, I and I always kind of wondered if it was called a shot glass because it was a brand of the glass I used to make the shot glasses. And, uh, right. I mean, it's even deeper than that. Right. It's potentially the originator of borosilica glass. And he was the, he was the originator of, of, of borosilicate glass. And so how did, uh, how did the Corning museum or how did Dow chemical or, or Corning originally, how did they invent borosilica glass? They had somebody that actually worked at Corning who was a student of a guy who was an assistant to Otto Frederick shot. Hmm. That's how Corning developed uh, their first borosilicate glass in the United States. Yeah, huh. so it was pretty cool. Yeah, it, through the through the and and on that same topic, I, I, and I, you know, we have all kind of folklore stories in this industry. And one of the things I'd heard was that when um, this guy, now I know that who it was, when he passed away, when he when they for the formula when it was released in a sense, quote unquote, that he left an ingredient out, and that's why there's such a variety of of glass out there right now because they couldn't figure out what exactly it was that he put in there extra to make the shot glass the shot glass i guess now you know because okay, everything okay. works everybody works a little bit different i mean clarity wise you know you're right you know and it's you're interesting right. so i wonder if it's like the coke formula that everybody's been trying to make the coke formula and they just there's something missing that just doesn't quite make a coke whether it's cocaine or right. what i don't fucking know but it's still this you know and you know what you're exactly right from uh you know north star's not too far from here i also of course took a uh, took one of the best color classes in the world from the lady, you know, who, who helped bring the color palette of borosilicate to the table, which is that Sue Ellen Fowler. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I've been able to take a little bit of classes from these guys. And so you're exactly right. It's like a secret chili recipe. It's like cooking, being a cook, a chemist, you know? And, and so, uh, yeah, it's this, it's this really cool special thing. And, um, and that's why I really like, uh, you know, North Star Glass and, and, and Alchemy and 
and uh, you know uh, tag glass because they're all formulating their own creativity and uh, you know have that creative product of of different colors and you you can tell that they're all a little bit different just yeah. like just like what we produce in the glass industry as artists yeah exactly and especially now we have these little boutique companies that are coming out on the side that are artists that are inspired to make their own glass and now they're making their own livings making and manufacturing borosilicate color for this you know for us now it's fun oh, to see this. It's, it's crazy. It's an explosion of color. I haven't even got a chance to get my hands on half the shit out there right now. Yeah, me neither. And that's, you know what, that's something that I aspire to do more of. And I do buy a little bit of it, but but really do buy some uh, hand-pulled tubes and stuff like that. Yeah. That's that's kind of where I make my my higher-end shot glasses. When I get when I get some good tube that I pull with somebody or, or maybe they, you know, I'll meet them at a show and I'll, I'll find somebody who just has some really good tube and those make the best shot glasses. Yeah. Hell yeah. So I bet. So, uh, so yeah. And so, you know, so, so what I did is I, I pretty much kind of, you know, I think I gave you the majority of, you know, the first book, the contemporary shot glass. I think that, I think that I covered most of it. Um, you know, I'll kind of go into the rest of the project now, which I'll, which yeah. is, um, so after, so one cool thing is I had the new owner of Tiffany and Fenton fly out to see me. They liked the idea of the shot glass book and, uh, some of my work and found out that, uh, you know, they, they didn't have, there was a guy that was on a, uh, a board of directors for the state of Philadelphia who's trying to bring back jobs to America. And one of them was through glass. And so, you know, I was having, let's say just this thing became selling 2000 books. You know, uh, the guy that owns Tiffany and Fenton, for those of you that know, for that guy to fly out and see me, you know, for a North star to put up, I knew I had this really great idea. I learned a lot of stuff through the book one of them that I learned um, that got me onto this next project was that they came, that that machine that I talk about in the first book from 1926 digs in and is what created the obsolescence factor. Huh. Interesting. And so the light bulb is, you know, when you have a cartoon and you see a light bulb come on, it's because the light bulb was the best idea known ever to man it yeah. gave us light yeah yeah it gave it, it gave us light we could see it spawned electricity um and once again this this isn't this isn't the greatest thing but obviously yeah it gave us the obsolescence factor and so you could you could literally dig into the obsolescence factor and dissect it and there's movies and documentaries on the obsolescence factor and so it's it's huge. Uh, I mean, it's just it's so unreal. Just that topic alone, but it's cool that it was a glass item and a glass machine that created an economy across the world. It created an economy in America. And so, what I found out is that, you know, if you had a machine in 1926 that would make a half a million glass objects, that it cut it it it, it cut out and wiped out. 80% of the glass industry in America and in the world overnight. Yeah, I know it's terrible. So yeah. you could, you could imagine being in 1926 where they made bottles all over New Jersey, 300 glass factories yep. that made bottles and light bulbs. You were looking over and you said, Hey, that machine's out and you lost your job. And so, so really what this next book is about, it's about a machine, the obsolescence factor. It's about, 300 um, glass shops shut down in America and then it's about it's about Dow Chemical you know they when Dow Chemical and Corning got together and I don't know exactly how they got together except for you know of course they had a relationship because you have to have a scientific glass blower to do real chemistry mm -hmm. and so what's the vehicle for for alcohol the shot glass what's the vehicle for marijuana the pipe What's the vehicle for chemistry, a test tube, an apparatus? And so what do you need to make an atom bomb, a nuclear bomb, napalm, agent orange? 
I found out, and I've been working with Mike Souza and reconfirming a lot of this, you have to have a glass blower. Mm -hmm. And so what I found out that happened in 1926, if you could make every single glass component on a microscope, a telescope, everything in the medical field, everything from on an aircraft carrier, a laser, a gun, a test tube, the vehicle for science, you'd have the biggest warfare you know, military, you know, uh, way, you know, you, you would be way closer than another country when you could, when you could make all the materials overnight and then take over an industry and finance the science behind glass. And so what happened after that machine was made is Dow chemical corning got together. They literally, you know, um, started a business with all kinds of different companies. And you can imagine that machine was uh, one of the vertebrae of America's spinal cord that financed America. Hmm. Interesting. And so it is super interesting. And so, and, and I could dive in real deep as far as saying, you know, I told you about the guy who made the first bottle machine. And then I told you about the Corning who made the other machine. Well, in the 1930s, those two companies get together they create fiberglass. They create fiberglass insulation for the construction construction industry. Yep. Then what else do they do? They make saran wrap. They make silly putty. They make silicone breast implants. They make every adhesive known to man just about. They make silicone. They make silicone microchips. They make so many things to help science that they make and they they invent dichro. They're the very first ones to ha to make a vapor deposition. They make um, uh, uh, fibers for you know the internet, for cell phones, for Wi-Fi. You know they they create fiber optics. They actually create the biggest thing that they created was they made and helped uh, make all the pharmaceutical industry. Mm. And so Dow Chemical and Corning actually have a business together with Eli Lilly. Crazy. Makes sense. And though. so and and yeah, and it does. It makes sense. And it's not a conspiracy against Corning, but it is but it is you know, you know who and then this is another interesting thing is who backed the light bulb? JP Morgan. Oh, huh, interesting. That's yeah, I remember that now. Yeah, that's the bank of the day. <laughs> yeah, and so that's right. So what, what I'm learning is is that this glass machine, eventually there would be 17 of them that would make 5 million glass objects and 80% of all the glass that you come into contact with would be made by this machine. Amazing. At one, at one point. Yeah. It, they, they now have what's called S&M machines and they're systematic and they're, it's a little different but because we've gone through same thing, we've gone through um, – you know, time and, and things have evolved and all that. But, you know, I'm not, I, and, and so this is what I'm, <clears throat> so going back to the story. So the American shot glass, my next book is about some of the basic fundamentals, which are the obsolescence factor, the light bulb, Dow chemical, um, you know, the, 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 the pharmaceutical industry, um, the Phenobi, pho, the Phobius cartel, which was a light bulb um, cartel that got together worldwide, Philips, GE, Switzerland, you know, and they they put a they put a time limit on the light bulb, so that's part of the obsolescence factor. But I'm not dissecting all of this stuff in the book. This next book is to showcase the shot glass, tell people about the history of the shot glass, and then slowly drift into telling people about the history of the glass industrial revolution through the shot glass. Now, if I, if I made a book and I just put a, a book out on the glass industrial revolution, you just won't get that many people going towards it and gravitating towards it. So yeah. by looking through the shot glass, the shot glass on the front cover, then you have people gravitating because the shot glass, like the pipe is so cool. They gravitate towards and they learn something about they learn something about the history of glass, how 300 factories were shut down in the 1930s and 40s due to this machine. And they learn about the obsolescence factor. They learn about how we're ruining the world with the obsolescence factor. 
And so, you know, if I, if I could, if I could get that done and, and, and teach people something, you know, through the shot glass, that's kind of my mission. Now I'm going to jump back just real quick and say that after the first book, I got sponsored for, for another big project, which was how to make three shot glasses. And then I did tell a little bit of the, the story that I'm telling you right now through that video. I just finished it. It's just about to be released. And uh, it's a really great, it's a really, really cool video. Yeah, it's exciting. And so, yeah, so it's, it's super exciting. And um, about, and now I'm going to, I'm going to kind of, and if you have anything to ask Jason, feel free. I know I could go on and on because I'm really so passionate. Oh, yeah. About this. Well, I just find it interesting with this whole thing with like what you're talking about. It's like the butterfly f effect of the shot glass, <laughs> you know? Or and it really, really is. Yeah, it's, it's so interesting. I mean, really from the invention of borosilicate per se, but really from this particular item from that machine that manufactured it yeah. to where it is now. It's like it's and – and that's the way my brain works. I like to see things in like branched out from a starting point, you know, whether I'm going on a road trip or making something, whatever it is. It's my way my brain works. I don't know if it's my ADD or what the fuck it is. But that being said, I appreciate right. what you're talking about because I can see that. I can see this historical branch of this butterfly effect per se of – the fucking shot glass and what it's caused. It's like the six degrees yeah. of separation from Kevin Bacon bullshit, you know? Oh, you know what? It's so true. And, you know, one thing that I forgot to tell you is that uh, I called Jack Daniels for two years before I even printed the book. When I printed the book, uh, it just was luck. I think I was into six months of the book being printed, and my mom calls me in the shop and says, Eli, come in here, come in here. Jack Daniels is on the phone. And I'm like, Jack Daniels, like the corporate. Yes. And I go in and I tell this guy the story that I'm telling you right now, like the head fucking dude at Jack Daniels. dude. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> and he says to me, he says to me, you know what? We don't call people back. I got your message. I want to hear your story. What do you want to do? I said, I want to come out to Jack Daniels. I want to tell the history of the shot glass on your annual event. And I want to make shot glasses on the spot and just and tell the story. Yeah. And they and they loved it. They they absolutely fucking loved it. And then he says and, and after I told him the story and I got him and, and passion is a lot of, of enthusiasm and that kind of stuff is sometimes it, it it can it can get in the way. So you have to be very careful because people can people can mistake mm -hmm. passion and enthusiasm for a bullshitter. Yeah, or a little bit of craziness. So, yeah, for sure. And so I've learned that over this experience that this book, people would come to me and say, you know what? I thought you were bullshit, man. All that shit you said, you fucking did it. This is crazy. So either way, what happened was um, they told me that they'd like to use the book as a form of advertisement to tell a story within Jack Daniels. Right. And I mean – you know what? I was so fucking stoked at the time I went into a dream state because what my that was my kind of goal with this book. Something that I left out was that there's all these people making pipes. Look at the hundreds of billions of dollars in the pipe industry. The part of the reason that I did the contemporary shot glass book was to start a movement and to tap into the hundreds of billions of dollars in the alcohol industry and to bring jobs back to America, to bring jobs back to American glassblowers. Fuck yeah. And you can imagine if you if we all, every glassblower out there, could tap into drinkware, not just the shot glass, but all the drinkware out there, yeah. and the hundreds of billions of dollars, we could create a collectible just like the pipe, but it only takes us to make these things and we start the demand, as you know. Yeah, I think it's a great idea. I mean, I see that work all the time. People come in that collect our, our wine glasses over at the Magic Kingdom. And it's just because okay. they're, they're Disney fans and they come in and they want their annual whatever variety of wine glass we were having that year, you know. And right. it's the collectors. And, and you're smart by saying that, too, with the, the alcohol people because it's, it's glass is glass, whether it's a shot glass, a fucking Stein or I mean, there's, you know, such a variety of glasses, especially with the craft beer movement nowadays. You got to have a certain glass for a certain kind of beer. You know, and right. as much as we all want to make pipes, sometimes it's fun to not make pipes and make things you can have fun making and still make money and still have, have your voice in that piece. Right. And then, and then you killer. know what? And it kind of, 
you know, one thing that I showcased in the book a little bit, but I, I could have wrote a, just same thing. I could have wrote a whole article on this is that it really gets you closer to studying the con or the, the, the two prohibitions, which are marijuana prohibition and alcohol prohibition. And the commonalities between the two are so similar, except a five-year-old can buy a shot glass, a five-year-old, you know, and, and, and what I'm saying is that the liquor industry, it's more accepted mm -hmm. than the pot industry. And you can go and get drunk and, and drive and do all kinds of shit. But, but the marijuana is, is better now that it's opening up now, but you know how it was even 10 years ago. Yeah. Um, the difference between the two. So I like kind of, uh, uh, you know, th this topic comes up a lot uh, in my everyday, you know, when I'm out there in the scene. So, so this is, so I know that uh, we, we've talked a lot. I'm going to, I'm going to tell you, tell you on this, this, uh, this next, go on to this next phase now, which is, you know, I, I started doing all this stuff, the, 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 the shot glass, uh, contemporary shot glass book. And then I did what's called the American shot glass documentary slash how to video. And then I'm working on this next book, the American shot glass. Well, what is the American shot glass? I, I explained it to you guys. It's a story of, um, conspiracy. It's a story of the shutdown of glass America. It's a story of bringing back handmade glass objects, the obsolescence factor. And so I was with a media person. She had showed up at my booth about a year ago and she she had heard my story i was on the news here and i was in the paper and stuff and people have heard my story locally and she came to me and she said eli i think you have a documentary and she works for sundance films she was one, she's a big broadcaster news broadcaster and a, and kind of a media face in the community hell yeah and i kind of yeah and i thought wow this is cool and you know what? She never came by again. I gave her my number and, you know, people get busy and they, they put things off and whatever. And about a year later, I was with another friend of mine and he says to me, man, Eli, this is like a documentary and a light bulb came on. And I, I said to myself and I started to think about Marble Slinger's documentary a little bit. Mm -hmm. I started to think about his documentary. I'd watched it and I started studying all the glass documentaries I could find, and I couldn't find hardly any. Yeah, there's not. And many I started out there. to think of. So I called. I called North Star. I called Coatings by Soundberg. I called Carlisle. I called Mylon Townsend. I called Robert Mickelson. I called the top glass blowers in the world to see if they would sponsor a documentary geared towards Netflix. And mm -hmm. I potentially got you know, already about $20,000 with, with, with what, with what my camera crew can do, you know, if I can get 40 to $60,000 for a budget, then I, what I have set up is interviews with some of the oldest glass shop families who are in their nineties in the oldest, richest glass America in New Jersey and New York hosted by, and, and accompanied by, you know, guys like Mike Souza and Mary Doherty from from Carlisle that are that are all sponsoring me. And and they're actually all team members, you know, that we're just I'm using them as a resource. to. And so right now it's um, it's on the back burner because I have to get I'm working on this book and I'm getting this book done. I just got the video done and I haven't even got it all the way printed. And so what I'm saying is, is that we have all these motions in our mind and, and, uh, uh, the fruitation hasn't even, 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 even came into play of even, even starting this thing. But I think after everything that I told you, you could probably imagine a Netflix documentary for the glass community on the history of glass. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I can totally see Truth. it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I'm, so I'm really excited, uh, about it. And, um, and yeah, so that that's kind of that's kind of uh, you know, quite a bit of it in a in a in a in a big huge nutshell. <laughs> yeah, dude. Well, it's exciting. It's you know, it's 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 one of those things. It's one of those objects. I just it's 
I guess it's like, why don't other people make them? You know, I just never, I never yeah. really thought about it. And I know, like, I've worked with some guys in studios that, that did art and craft shows besides doing, you know, make, being pipe makers, and they had a variety of shot glasses, nothing fancy or really anything, but the stuff you're putting out there is pretty badass. It's like stuff that you would see in a smoke shop that's a pipe, but it's not a pipe, it's a, yeah. it's a, it's a shot glass. So I guess, like, yeah. you know, early on in your career, I mean, you're a pipe maker at heart, you know, but what was there a tra- like, where was there a transition in this whole phase of your glass life where you're like, cause like you go on your Instagram and I don't see pipes hardly at all, except for collabs that you've done. So like, right. we're like, so was, and you know what, you know, my, my old, so my older brother worked for JBD and you know, I started off doing little pipes and stuff. That's really got What got me interested. And then my wife at the time, couldn't stand me making pipes. Hmm. Sounds like my so, ex. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. I got a lot of shit, just like a lot of people did. You know, you got shit for making pipes. And so I started making a lot of little pigs and, and started studying Homer Hoyt's book, The Scientific Glass Board from NASA. Mm-hmm. And I got with Lewis Wilson and uh, got all his videos and took some classes from him and just – yeah, it, it set me on a way to, to finding out here in Eugene with almost 6,000 glass blowers in Lane County. Once again, I wanted to separate myself. I found out that early in the, my beginnings that nobody wanted to make frogs and nobody wanted to make hearts or wiener dogs or all these little things that all these Walt Disney guys did. But what happened? Walt Disney started buying stuff from China in the in the 90s. Yeah, well, we're well, so, the company I work for. We're actually a third party, so we're in like, okay, we're, yeah, we're considered to be an operating participant. And so uh, the Re- the Rebus Brothers is the company, and uh, right. yeah, we eventually yeah, it got to a point to where because like now we're on all every park around the fucking world that you know all the shops, and yeah, so we our stuff is such a broad variety of stuff and glass. And we've got a small crew. Like they used to have a crew that made everything, and then they started having cutbacks and everything else, and the budgets and blah blah blah. So like it's like now it's half and half, you know, basically. Okay. What it's come down to you know, so we have like our okay, our, you know, our overseas stuff, and then we have our in-house stuff. And the stuff we make in-house usually just stays in-house. There's some regulations in Shanghai that's not letting us actually blow glass on site there, but we have a like we have a glass okay. engraver. So a lot of times we'll ship certain items that we make in house at Magic Kingdom, for instance, and we'll ship it to Shanghai. Or like I've made like we our original shop was in Disneyland, and I'm in Disney World in Orlando. So the whole times like there's times where we make stuff here for our shop out there because there's no longer glass blowers, and the Disney environment has also taken us operating you know participants basically. And we get shuffled around and our stores get smaller or they get really fucking big and we got to fill everything up, all this space we have now, you know. It's really interesting. Just a kind of a side well, note, you, you know, on that. Well, you know what? And, and I, I, I used to uh, work with a couple guys that worked for, you know, subcontracted for, for uh, Disney 2, which was that Sean Sai and Bo Sai. And, uh, and so, yeah, they, they used to make stuff. But but it, what And what I'm talking about here, what I'm going into yeah, is yeah. that it's – it's kind of like the machine to for for, for and, and and what you talk about is that for really everybody to even make enough stuff for everybody who's a customer of Walt Disney would for everybody in America would take a place like China a place that was huge that could mass produce stuff which we just don't do that in this country anymore mm-hmm. yeah exactly so so yeah and so but i could understand how many glass blowers it would take just in America if you didn't get any imports at all and you would and you understand this mm-hmm. but I'm talking to our to the people who are listening right now that it's kind of like the machine yeah. you know it's a it's the same concept it, it, it took our jobs away and so by doing this documentary bring back handmade American glass I think it brings back just like there's no sock companies I mean if the you know, if if a guy from Tiffany would come out here and try to get ideas from me about the shot glass, go home, decide that he didn't want to work with me because he couldn't really pay me enough, and he just he was kind of a a kind of guy that was kind of lowball me. So I ended up telling Tiffany uh, and the guy that owns Fenton that that I didn't want to work with him because he's too of a too much of a of a hustler. And so um so yeah, but if you get a guy like that that's actually trying to bring jobs back through America, goes home. And puts on a uh, uh, 
his website that he's looking for shot glass makers because, hey, the American shot glass is not made unless it's in soft glass in, and it's not – it's they're not these unique things. Now you go into soft glass in Italy, you go to all these other places. Yeah, they're making cane shot glasses and stuff like that. And that's where me and you were talking earlier that since the shot glass hasn't really been touched or made in almost a hundred years, is that there's huge room for design with all the new techniques that the lamp working community has come up with. They've the techniques that the lamp working community has come up with have never been put into a shot glass. Yeah, I agree. hundred percent. And what's interesting with the shot glass too, like I make them myself for gifts here and there. Like my dad collects them. So I make them one for his birthday every year and they're really fucking easy to make, but it takes a couple to get the proportions down. I mean, and it doesn't have to be a perfect shot either, but ideally if you want to mass produce them or have a market that wants a perfect shot, then you got to have you know, your ounces and stuff figured out. But that being said, it's a really simple piece, and just using the magnification of the amount of glass you have on the base alone, there's so much you can do with implosions. I mean, you can make a living off just doing implosion bases on these little clear you know, body shot glasses, just leaving the bodies clear. I mean, and you're making them fully worked, you know? And, and you know what? And that might be something that you might even tap into when you make yours for the American shot glass, the new book. They're... they're I did do a, a flower implosion, but it won't be – I am not doing with one for this new book, but nobody's really tapped into doing implosions on the bottom, and I think you're onto something. I think it's a great idea, and look out there. Look at for look yeah. for shot glasses yeah. with implosions on the bottom. There's not many. No, uh-uh. You know, um, I've got Hugh Jean in the new book. I've got Gregory Paul Shire. You know, one thing I want to tell you, two things before – why they're on my brain here just real quick is that – Paul Stankard said that this shot glass collection from the contemporary shot glass is the nicest shot glass collection ever put together in the history of glass. Wow. Yeah, that's awesome. That's, and a, huge, so that's a huge thing. It, it's super coming cool. From him. <laughs> yeah, coming from him, it, it was gold to me. And then another thing that I liked about the project and about the book is that the, the book really certified that the shot glass – is the number one collectible in glass untouched by the glass community. Yeah, it's true. It and is. So yeah, I completely agree. That's one of our biggest you, sellers you, too at work is shot glasses. Oh, yeah. And, and, and you can imagine, you can buy a shot glass in a gas station, a gift shop. You can buy it in a liquor store at the airport. You can buy them in a grocery store. You can buy them everywhere. And so why? Because they make 5 million of them every 24 hours. Mm-hmm. They put labels on them. And they they became a novelty. And so why didn't people make them? There you go. Yeah. You know, because they're they're everywhere. Nobody was ever inspired again. And so this dreams really come true. And uh, I I hope that everybody who's listening this uh, to this episode uh, goes out and makes a shot glass because that's part of the end goal. Yeah, me too. That that that's that's the. That's that's the that's the thing that says, hey, you know, I like that. I I think he's right. I I I agree with that. Let's go make a shot glass, and you know what? Let's make a set of shot glasses. Let's make let's make uh, fifty shot glasses or twenty five shot glasses for this new distillery down the road, and uh, they're gonna want they're gonna want uh, you know their own set. I found out that every high end bar in America, if you can't sell the bar, a set of shot glasses. They buy one for every single worker at Christmas time, mm-hmm. and so it's just a, it's just a. If you had one shot, if you had one opportunity to seize everything you ever wanted, would you do it? Yes, I would, and that's what I did with this book. Fuck yeah! Well, you know, it reminds me like uh, Maker's Mark. They do a an ornament for uh, that they sell like a limited edition ornament for whiskey every year, and uh, one of the years they had. Their, their artist or whoever made them uh, dipped the top of them in wax like they do their bottles and inside of the ornament was like this brown liquid clear fluid and some acrylic ice cubes and there's a whole story Dude. on the artist that made them and about this ornament that he made and that's and that's another thing it's like the tradition of the ornament alone is a whole nother story you know I mean oh the, man much less the shot glass I think this is a great topic of conversation because everybody wants to make a fucking rig it's like dudes learn your medium and then figure out how to make a shot glass because 
as I said, they're easy to make. If you don't know what the fuck you're doing, right. they're, not, they're not easy to make. You know, I mean, you can take a piece right. of tubing and just cut it in sections and flatten the bottom of it and call it a day, but that's, you know, whatever, it's bullshit. Put your voice and your right. art into a piece of material. I mean, if, if you're going to make a Q-tip holder, you might as well make a fucking shot glass. <laughs> and our industry and the right. community on Instagram that is all hyped up about all this new shit coming out on a regular basis, there's no reason that there could be a whole new market through social media selling fucking shot glasses. One more thing yes. to add to your to your collection of items that you make. Yes. You know, a whole set. I you know, for the for the last six years, I've sold anywhere from thirty thousand to fifty thousand dollars worth of shot glasses a year. Hell yeah. And so congrats. Yeah, it's, awesome. it, 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 it's it's untapped. Um yeah, it, it is it's cool. I I I'm really stoked. I I, I love the whole project. I I couldn't be happier. I mean, I literally think about it every second right now. Um, I'm, I'm constantly doing research. I mean, I'm not kidding you. All day long, I'm on the phone with somebody. You know, why I blow glass, I'll take a break. I'll call somebody. I'll take a break. I'll call somebody. I mean, I just just recently I found, let's say, I mean, I, I hope to teach the, the listener something too, like on a project like this. Just like when you're creating to make a glass piece, you're thinking about all the time what you're going to make. You're looking at other things and what you're going to make. Well, that's the same thing with this project. For example, today um, I looked up, you know, what were the top 20 glass manufacturing companies in the country? And uh-huh. then, you know, I, I looked those guys up and, and what do I do? I take a picture of, of all the companies and then I'll write a proposal letter proposal letter about the project and then I'll send it to their corporation and hopefully get somebody to bite on it. Now, if you can do stuff like that and, and let's say somebody out there, you know, does get a project, um, those are the kinds of things that you do. You treat it like you were going to college. You treat it like an essay. You treat it like a book report. And, 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 you know, I just, I never thought, ever that that any of this would would really happen you know this this whole project uh, as far as i feel like it's a miracle you know for me and for the glass community and uh, everybody who's involved in it i just i'm so so grateful appreciative and uh want to do this for the glass industry you know and, and do it for all of us because i think it's, it's huge that, oh sorry to cut. i didn't mean to cut you off sorry Oh no no no! You're right. Yeah, it's huge, and 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 it's huge for all of us, you know. And I and I've never been the kind of guy that 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 wanted to make. I mean, I I I went through that period of my life where I wanted to make the coolest piece in glass, and I wanted to be that guy too. And so I can understand everybody out there when we're talking about dreams, you know, dreams in making a piece and making your piece piece or your first piece and showing someone. And dreams of, you know, actually standing out in something that you're good at, that you love. And so I can understand all that. And so that's why I have the grat. you know, that's why I'm really grateful for, for my life and everything that I've been able to do, because I know this is going to take me into far away places and, and, uh, I'm just real happy and grateful, like I said. Yeah, man, it's awesome. It's and it's amazing, you know, like you're saying with the dream and the journey, where when you find that thing, where it can take you, and it's just no matter what you have in life, how fucked up life can be, as long as you can stay on track with that one specific thing. I mean, glass has got me through my life the last almost 20 years. I mean, I don't know where I'd be without it in my life. I know I'll never right. get bored, but like just you know, it's helped me grow into the character and the person I am today from all the mistakes I've made in glass, you know, and I've learned that yeah. in glass, I have to learn from those mistakes to get to the next level And life's the same fucking way. I've made sh- some stupid fucking mistakes and I've learned from those fucking mistakes. And I pray to God that I'll never make those mistakes again. I've done it in glass. Right. I did it in life, but you move forward and hopefully you don't do it again. You know, and it's, there's so much in the glass itself and the process of what we do in the learning process that completely is hand in hand with life. And it's, you know, those of us that can do it for a living, you know, I mean, I, I feel every day I go to work, I'm, I'm so grateful and blessed at what I get to, uh, to pay to do every fucking day. And, you know, it's just, I don't know, man, I'm, it makes me speechless like right now, <laughs> you know, right. crashing and burning. It's just amazing. It's just the opportunities, but you got to really, I guess with the whole thing, I guess my whole point was, is, is 
you have to understand that no matter how things work out, if you don't pay attention to the doors that are opening for you and don't walk through those doors, you can sit around and pray for things all day, but if you don't take advantage of the things that are given to you, you're going to be fucked and you're not going to get those dreams realized. You know, like I heard some, you know, somebody's uh, ancient philosopher or whatever was something about like the, the, uh, some guy went to a door for him to, for an opportunity and he's like, Oh, I'll go through that tomorrow. And like 20 years later, like, Hey, this door's here for you still. And he's like, Oh, I'm gonna go through it tomorrow. And he's like, they're dead on the front door. And he's like, you know, goes off to heaven. And he's like, why didn't you go through that door? And he's like, I was going to go through it, but then I died. And he's like, well, that door is only there for you. It's not there for anybody else. You wasted your time sitting there waiting to go through that fucking door. And these doors like, right. you know, you obviously walk through some doors, dude, that got you to these opportunities to be a publisher. I mean, yeah. who, you know, would you have ever thought you one day what? you'd publish a book? I, I didn't. And you know what? It goes back to exactly what you said. And I think we share a lot of commonalities. All, all of us glass blowers is that, I had a hard time in life. I went through rehab. I did all kinds of stuff that I don't even want to talk about on here that I'm embarrassed to say because – and you know what? I think there's something to it. I think people that have had problems, uh, maybe you know, some kind of life problems or maybe they did dangerous stuff even that was, that was just the stupidest thing. I think some of those people, they're good at glass because glass is dangerous and you, and you have to kind of – you kind of have to be a little bit of, um, you know, a hellion almost. I think. I think I see a lot of glass blowers that I'm identifying in my head right now that that were kind of like that. They were kind of risk takers, kind of like a motorcycle. You know, you don't you don't like, send somebody on a motorcycle flying through the air. That's normal. Right. I, I mean, I compare it to the <laughs> skateboarding community a lot. You know. <laughs> Like, you know, then this being a, a skateboarder and having this. I mean, back in the day, you know, before it was accepted per se. You know, kind of like yeah. where the glass community is now, even though technically it's still illegal for what the pipe makers are doing. But that being said, you know, we're now accepted in the community. We have a voice. We have our tricks. We have our style. We have our flair, blah, blah, blah. The same things that skaters have had, but it's the same kind of personality. Not just anybody's going to jump on a skateboard and go do a fucking 900 backflip, you know, with your hair on fire kind of shit. Right. You know, right. But, but I think, too, yeah. part of it for me, for myself, I find that reasons I've done it for so long is going back to my having my ADD bullshit, which I bring up all the time in this fucking show. But it's just I know a lot of us deal with this crap. And for me, because it is such a dangerous thing, it really makes me focus on it and allows me to follow through on things because I don't have a choice. You know what I mean? And, right. and that alone has taught me outside of the torch to that. Hey, I, if I have a task, I'm starting. I got to fucking finish this now. Instead of having yeah. twenty five different little tasks that never get finished, yeah, you know, and, and you, and I mean, you can tell I've got ADD too, and you can tell that, you know, and that's part of my problem. I mean, I guess I could talk to you about a couple other projects that I'm doing, but I didn't want to go off into them, even though they're really fucking cool, mm -hmm. you know. But um, but but I won't go go into them. Well, we can bring and, you back uh, another should, time, share it. Yeah, I've got another documentary that's in the works, and and same thing. I've already talked to people, and it, and 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 I know it sounds like, and that's where I don't want to lose focus and be like I'm all over the fucking place. Mm -hmm. But I'm the same way, man. I've got other shit going on, and it and it seems like, wow, this is this sounds like bullshit. And the next thing you're like, damn, dude, this thing's fucking gold, man. And so one thing that we'll go back to on the conversation that we we're talking about is that, yeah. 20 years you said that uh you know glass got you through and you know it, it happened to me too and one day you know i started finding out that i was learning so much from glass and one day i came up with this i and i got it on it's on my next video as the the very beginning of the video and it's a it's a quote that came up in my head that i made and i knew i was going to use it forever was i shaped the glass and then it shaped me hmm. and it <laughs> and it really did. It That's shaped such... me into a brand new person, man. And I'm, I'm, and once again, I'm so grateful that glass was almost like a religion for me that I hung around people that enjoyed their life. I hung around people that wanted to be something, you know, you people that were making things that were exciting. And it was, they were, they were being identified by what they made, you know? Yeah, so Yeah. It, it was, man. It's still just like you. Uh, and I talked to Mylon Townsend, like I said, this week. He wakes up. You know, we wake up. You wake up. We wake up every day because, you know, the blood's flowing because we're ready to make something. And we're ready to go play our guitar or saxophone or pick up our baseball bat or whatever. But for us, it's a, 
it's a glass rod and fire that that keeps our heart beating and going mm-hmm. yeah it certainly is dude so here's a conversation i want to have with you which i and don't take offense to this because i love your work but i want to talk about biting and and style now when i first started seeing your work Obviously, you know where I'm going with this. I'm, I'm pretty sure. But you have a huge influence of Salt's work in your work, which I love because you've taken yes. this concept of his work and come up with your own perspective on it. And you've made a name for yourself with this particular style. I know Salt doesn't give a fuck. If anything, he's happy about it because he's influenced somebody that is talented like yourself, has been able to take what he's taught and take it to a different level. Now, are you giving shit by people? Do people call you out and say, "Hey, you're fucking biting salt"? Like, or is it like, and I'm, and I'm, and if this makes you uncomfortable, dude, we, we ain't gotta talk about it. But I want to bring this up because I haven't had a chance to have like a Mike Shobo on, who's, you know, people bite his shit all the fucking time and don't get and right. anything. They talk shit about him, and right. you have an appreciation for salt, and I know you do, and I've seen it in your work and things you write about and talk about. So, I don't know, man. Right. Are you cool talking about like you want to talk about that, like, dude? In your style, I'm so glad. I'm glad you brought it up. You know, I'm. I'm I'm the kind of guy, you know, I'm I'm pretty easy going and 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 nothing really it, it's hard to bring me down and uh and, and this kind of stuff doesn't, you know, I'm I'm pretty open about it. I was a uh, my my older brother was a pottery teacher, my younger brother was a tattoo artist and I was I was actually apprenticing to be a tattoo artist before I got into glass. Hmm. And so what I found out in the very beginning of doing art was that people would get mad even here in Eugene this one guy if I made a frog <laughs> and so That's there would be there would, yeah so so really in so how I made a name for myself initially the why I made a name for myself initially really was is because I had two brothers one worked for JBD and he was a pipe maker and the other brother, he was a marble maker. And then I was the sculptor. And so you had this huge pipe industry and everybody was making pipes. And in, in you know, in 2000, I was hitting all the beat shows and, and all that stuff. And, you know, there just there wasn't a lot of people doing. I recognized like, wow, I could do all this stuff, uh, you know, that nobody else is making. But I did run into people. Obviously, I wasn't the only motherfucker out there. You had Kevin O'Grady and, you know, Harold Cooney even before mm -hmm. he made pipes. And, you know, you know the names. They're yeah. all out there. And so what I'm getting at is that I would, you know, when you first get into being an artist and especially blowing glass, you don't just go in and paint a picture. What do you do? You paint a picture of the ocean and, and what people have painted before. You paint pictures. And, and same with being a sculptor. You want to sculpt little gummy bears. You want to sculpt pizza. You want to sculpt little chickens. And you want to do all these things. And so I never got mad when somebody made something that looked like mine when it was a frog or of a flower or a jellyfish. So, so what I'm getting at is that there's a difference between – doing a jellyfish and then there's a difference between just totally ripping somebody's piece off and making it exactly the way it is and so uh, uh, I found out that they made that there was you know I found the very first hospital that contracted the very first glass blower a hundred years to make the very first glass eye and I started studying the history of the glass eye and so that kind of compelled me into making into into also making glass eyes. I met a guy named Gregory Gregory Paul Shire and he was influenced by Salt. He made eyeballs. And I met Salt years and years ago at a bead show. So and and I'm going to get to the get to the point here and I I'm not trying to step back here and there but what happened was I made so many hummingbirds armadillos, chihuahuas, um, frogs, rabbits, lizards, you know, all that kind of stuff that one day I see a monster <laughs> and I was blown the fuck away, dude. It was like someone injected a bodybuilder with steroids and I was like, oh my fucking God, I could do an eyeball. Well, guess what? 
I saw Gregory Paul Shire doing eyeballs and I said, you know what? I don't know if I'll ever be good enough to really do an eyeball. I mean, I can make these little frogs and all these hummingbirds and shit, but God, that shit looks intense. And so I didn't make them for, you know, 2000. I saw, I saw him making them. I didn't really make any till like 2006. And, you know, I got the same thing here in Eugene where I found out all my friends and stuff and everybody in Eugene, these 6,000 glass blowers, nobody wanted to make a monster. They were so scared of pissing off salt or somewhere or, or someone around here to make a monster. So like 2006, no one was making monsters in Eugene. And I said, you know what? Fuck this shit. I'm going to make a line of fucking monster spoons. I'm going to make a line of monster marbles, which nobody was making then, Mm -hmm. not even salt. I might have been the very first guy to do a vortex marble with eyeballs and shit all on the back of it. And I said to myself, I looked at salt. Okay, he he caters all all to the pipe industry. And I said, I'm going to make monsters for the art world, for the galleries, for these places that salt doesn't go to that. And I'm not going to make them salt way. I'm going to make them like when I started making frogs or anything else. I'm going to, I'm going to try to make it into my own, like take one of my brother's marbles or, you know, yeah, make a shot glass, you know, make things that, and and it wasn't like I was looking at him saying, I'm going to make this. I knew right away. I wasn't going to go try to copy oil rigs and bongs. And yes, I made a few bongs, few oil rigs, but I've never gone out there and try to hit, and I only sell pipes to people I meet. You cannot find a pipe of mine in a store unless somebody bought it from me four years ago. Hmm. I ended up quit selling pipes in stores because I was selling them too fast, and I couldn't keep up anymore, and I got tired of of making them. And so, yeah, so this long this long uh, question – and I think it's I think it's good just to to bring it out on the table, like you said. Yeah, that, yeah, absolutely. You know, I I just same thing. I just talked to Lucan, which is salt. Mm-hmm. You know, just yesterday actually, and uh, he's making a new glass for the new book. You know, he knows, and I've told him many times, and he knows that I give him credit where credit is due. I actually tell people that he was an injection, even though I have been blowing glass longer than salt has. You know, there's these guys like Sherbet and Hitman, which don't even compare to salt. But as far as their marketing strategies, there's some people that just, they rise above. Mm -hmm. You know, and salt, salt's to me, you know, salt and Eugene, uh, Micah Evans, Darby, you know, Bosai, those are my favorite glass blowers because they have this inner glow to them besides just the glow on the torch. They've got that inner glow, you know. It's almost like that. There's that that fucking movie, you know, with the the karate guy. When you got that glow, and he, <laughs> and, and they're beating the shit out of each other, you know. <laughs> but um, but yeah. And so I think that anybody should be able to make a frog. Anybody should be able to make an octopus. I inspire and teach people to make eyeballs and horns, and uh, never ever are they even close to as good as mine usually. And guess what? Mine are never, ever close to what salt can do. You know, Mm -hmm. he's, he's, he's on the top of the, 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 the realm. And he, and and so that's another reason, you know, there's, there's all these different things about people. Well, I wish I could make the best glass in the world. I couldn't. So I started doing books and media and I said, I'm going to do, What's my calling and what I'm good at. And so everybody has their facets and everybody's good at something and we're all connected. I really believe that we're all connected and that um, it's more than um, than just individuality. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so, I agree. I agree. Cause, um, we, so, yeah. We've, so that, all, we've all been inspired by somebody or many at some point in time, you know, throughout this career of ours. Yeah. Well, and I think like, you know, I don't think I finished it, but I think when you're in the very beginning of any art, it doesn't matter what it is that you have to be inspired first because you just don't go out and buy a glass 
uh, you don't go out and buy an oxygen tank, propane, and glass rods and just start blowing glass. Like a lot of those people out there who say, I'm self-taught. Well, yeah, you're fucking self-taught, but you fucking got an idea or inspired from somewhere. You just didn't fucking set up a glass shop and teach yourself how to fucking blow glass. Mm -hmm. And so it's the same thing with when you first get into art, you copy everybody. So people would call me a copycat for my first 10 years. And then after my first 10 years, or maybe even less, people really knew that I was Eli Mazet. Yeah. So, so yeah. And then, and then, yeah, this just, uh, you know, reconfirming that, you know, salt knowing that, you know, as some people might say, biting or, or ripping somebody off that with salt knowing obviously who I was, because, you know, salt was catering to the pipe industry since 2003 or whatever he, when, when he first started blowing glass, well, I was selling it probably more stores than he was selling at by far in my first five years in glass for sure than he was only because I was mainly selling at two to 300 glass galleries across the country, Mm. you know, doing, um, and and so, and, and because of, you know, going back to how I really made my first name was people, people really knew the Mazze brothers, you know, it was the Mazze brothers, you know, you, you didn't really have, you had the Davis brothers, but you didn't have brothers in glass back in the 1990s. You had Kevin O'Grady and George O'Grady. But I think having three brothers that all blew glass together really gave us an identity. And it's what really made me to even this day was that initial initial brother thing that everybody caught on to, like, what brother's making what? Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know? Yeah, it's pretty cool. Yeah, it's the, it, and so... So yeah, man, that's that's the uh, that's the Mazay story, and yeah. and uh, you know I like I said it's 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 been a great ride, and um, you know just just learning stuff from everybody, and and uh, you know taking all kinds of different things from different people, and I mean, he, he, you know I'll admit even when you made, and I know we talked about this before on the radio, but even. When you made that little snowman, I had to try one. Mm-hmm. You know, I I tried it that oh, day, uh, yeah, the day yeah. you made yeah. that little snowman, because I have three daughters that all love Walt Disney. So, and that's when I say to you that you really impressed me because my fucking snowman didn't even fucking touch yours. I was, <laughs> I mean, I should have thrown it. I should have thrown the motherfucker away. I was actually, I was actually like, that's when, and that's what I like about glass is that. Glass is kind of like seniority is that nobody just comes in and knocks a piece off to a T unless it's something super basic. Mm -hmm. You know, you really have to put in the work and do hundreds of them to really get that that feel of like, that's mine, motherfucker. And you can tell. Oh, yeah, dude. Well, that's not someone else's. (laughs) Yeah, totally. But even like with the Olaf, I mean, people ask me like how many or how long it took me to get them down. And I mean, it literally took me two weeks just to figure out the production side of it of how I was going to make it over and over and over and over just the steps of it and then I had to make at least a hundred if not more than that just to really tweak it to a point because like when I first I get my first piece I got approved which was I was happy about but it wasn't the the same character from the film and but it still represented the character it looked similar but not exactly and from myself and being a Disney nerd and also what I do as an artist, I wanted to nail that motherfucker. So it was like he was jumping off the screen. I mean, I had to watch the movie a thousand times. There was no three dimensional anything available because of how hot the movie was. Everything was selling. So I had to just figure it out myself after repetitions and practice and that. I mean, I'll never forget that when I finally got it and it was like a, it was a couple hundred of them into it. And I was able to say, okay, this is how I make it every fucking time is how I just did it now. And because it took me right. 200 times to get to that point, I understood the process and the steps. And it's that move is the chess match. And like just recently, my newest character I got approved was Remy from Ratatouille. And it's a Pixar character, which has different proportions than what Disney has. So it was even more difficult for me. And I'm doing him in clear, and it's hard to translate in clear. Like Olaf's in white, so it was easier to see. But in clear, it's not easy to see everything. So I started figuring out where I could add color for details, like his eyes or his ears or whatever. 
But I got to a point where I was so fucking frustrated. I was, I knew I wasn't going to give up, but I was at that point where it was like, either I break through this fucking wall and nail this motherfucker, or I'm not going to make this. I'm fucking pissed. And I was able to right. go take a deep breath and came back out there and fucking nailed it and just got the approval on it. And I mean, I, it literally brought me to tears. I was so excited, but I knew that as a me as a human being, I had that trial and tribulation of creativity and I was able to break past that shit and I had success at the end of it. And that just goes with anything in life that we're doing. The frustrations are right. there for us to understand. We got to break through that. And on the other side of the frustration, it's usually pretty green over there. Well, yeah. I'll, I, I'll have to get a couple of those snowmen from you someday for my kids, man, because... Cause those are uh, those are uh, hot a hot item for the for three. Do- I have three daughters. So. Nice. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna send you um, the the contemporary shot glass book just so that you can have a, a free copy of that for giving me the the opportunity to be on here, you know, this evening and, and for you to do this interview. I really appreciate it. So yeah, thanks, I'll make dude. Sure That's I cool. Get your- yeah, I'll get your address, and then you can kind of see where you fit in too when you do your shot glass yeah. for the book. You can get a good look at this, this flip through these, and say, okay, I, yeah, I see what you mean. I, I can fit in there somewhere. I, I got one. Yeah. Fuck yeah! Thank you. Yeah, man, I'm fucking stoked, dude. I'm stoked to get you in here. I'm, 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 I'm excited, and uh, uh, like I said, I've got, a, I've got a huge lineup in this one, and I'm just. The last, you know, the very first book I kind of wanted to get done right away. I thought, you know, I just want to get this done and out there. Uh, You know, I don't know if it was about, you know, somebody else like, oh, I'm the shot glass guy or or what it was or that I I just I loved. I guess I love the story so much. But um, but yeah, you know, uh, a, a good thing. You know, one thing Paul Stanker told me is that. You know, when you have a good idea, don't worry about it. Nobody's going to steal your candy because you already ate it, you know, and I, I think it kind of goes, I think that's something to say for the salt thing too, you know, like yeah. you, 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 you ate your candy and, and I think, I think that's kind of the same thing with this. And I think that's a, I think that's a good way to put it from, especially from an old guy like that, that, that uh, has been around a long time. <laughs> yeah, dude. Yeah. He's fucking incredible. But hell yeah, man. I think that's actually a really good point for us to uh, take a quick break and thank our sponsors. And then come back and it'll be time for us to crash the kiln. Okay, right on. This segment of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by Zen Dude Fitness. Lose 10 pounds this month by joining the Zen Dude Fitness 4-Week Jump Rope Fat Loss Challenge. Brandon and Dan will take you on a guided journey towards becoming the best you. Get fit, have fun, and find new ways to eat healthy while still enjoying the sweeter side of life. Just takes 20 to 30 minutes a day and no gym required. For more info and to sign up for the free four-week challenge, go to wiseguymedia.com forward slash zen dude fitness. That's wiseguymedia.com forward slash zen dude fitness. Yeah, man, the Crash in the Kiln round consists of seven questions, and uh, you can give me a 30 to 60-second answer with them, and if you can want to expound upon them, we always do. And the first question I always like to ask to get things started here is if there's any living glass artists that you haven't worked with yet and you want to, uh, who is it and why? I think if I was worked with anyone, it would be Vittorio Constantini, and mainly because I learned a lot of stuff from his videos that probably took me to another level uh, more than anybody else. Hell yeah. Yeah. Dude's so it would be phenomenal. Vittorio. Yeah. Hell I love his stuff and, and I've learned a lot of stuff from his videos. If you don't have the video, you can get it at the Corning museum. It's 32 pieces of glass that he makes that you get to watch him make. And it's just, it's worth a million dollars. Yeah. Fantastic. <laughs> what are your, uh, top five favorite colors in glass? Uh, my favorite colors in glass. I like rust red, Blue Moon, Amber Purple. Um, I really like Lilac. And then I got to say, you know, I, I really like Slime. Oh, yeah. I like the original Slime the best still. Yeah. There, yeah. I like the I like the old Slime, too. I, I, you know, I ordered some a couple years ago and they had that shift where they had like three or four different Slimes. And so. Yeah, I've, I I get them all now, but I, I I like to use them as an accent more than uh 
more than make the whole piece. I, I really like to use it as an embellishment. Yeah, same here. I do this. And that's why I was happy with the Illuminati when that came out because it's got that same similar. It's more yellow, but it's got that nice opalescent oh. translucent oh, yeah, and I, color. I, oh, yeah. I, I do love the uh, the lemon drop, too. Oh, yeah. Mm-hmm. That, that's a fuck. I love that shit. Yeah, it's sexy. Hell, yeah. So uh, if you want to give us your worst injury in the studio. My worst injury in the studio. Somebody came through my shop door, and, and at the time my, my torch was closer to the door than it is now. But they came through at a moment where I was really – it was an intense moment for me, and I was all by myself, and they came flying through the door. They scared the shit out of me. I went to look over, and my thumb went into the full-fledged flame. Mm. And and I kid you not, I was under ice for 18 hours. It was like – it looked like a hot dog got burnt in the fucking campfire. It was fucking bad, dude. It hurt. I remember sitting in a Chinese restaurant fucking – with my hand in a fucking water ice bucket trying to eat fucking Chinese buffet. (laughs) (laughs) I was starving at the time too, obviously, but yeah, I'd had the munchies, so whatever. That's the worst. (laughs) Yeah, I've done that twice in 18, almost 19 years now. (sighs) Okay. Fuck. Yeah, it sucks. If you could describe the sound of glass cracking in one word, whether uh, the actual sound of it or a metaphorical word or what have you, uh, what is it? I guess it'd be a tick, a tick kind of sound. Cool. You, you hear this little, it's almost like, yeah, it's like, it's like, yeah, I guess like, yeah, just a little tick, a little, yeah, I, I guess I can't, I can't really. It's a it's common. A tick. Yeah, it's a common, it's a common word used on the show. <laughs> yeah, it make. I guess it makes me tick. It feels like I have a tick when it happens. <laughs> 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 that's fucking funny when you're in the shop do you uh, watch tv or listen to the radio or do you do both i don't watch tv i i every once in a while i'll, I'll i love my favorite thing to do i like to i never let school get in the way of my education and so i always will put on maybe something like recently uh, a documentary about the obsolescence factor or Maybe something on how it's made or, you know, there's a lot of those uh, podcasts and stuff mm-hmm. that maybe they'll give the guy on the history of the guy that came up with like putting body parts all around his uh, place. He he was like one of the first morticians, you know, like yeah. just just oddball shit like that. I love to I love to learn stuff while I'm blowing glass. And then, of course the majority of the time I'm listening to like hip hop or Michael Franny spearhead. Hell yeah. Yeah. I do. Yeah. Audiobooks are great for that. Like for the amount of time that we sit and on, you know, and focus. And uh, it's why part of my, uh, it's, I'm not sponsored by them, but one of the affiliate programs is through audible.com. And, uh, I like to drop little plugs. So if you haven't heard this plug yet, uh, if you want to get a free 30-day trial and a audiobook at audibletrial.com, just go to audibletrial.com forward slash wise guy radio and uh, hook it up because audiobooks are great ways to go through the day. And like you're saying, it's an education at the same time or potentially. Whether it's yeah, I haven't yeah. heard of that. I might I might even tune into that. Yeah, that sounds really cool. Yeah, man, it's killer. And then it's like fifteen bucks a month after your first free month that you get, and you get like okay. three books a month you can that you can download, and you can download like you know thirty forty hours worth of material on a book. Some it depends on what you get. It's fucking awesome. I love it. Fuck yeah, that sounds cool. Hell yeah. So do you have any glass blowing theme tattoos? I do. You know, I've got. You know, and, and, and people love this, man. And, and you know what? I, same thing. When I started getting, uh, I, I think I told you I was uh, uh, apprenticing to be a tattoo artist. My brother was a tattoo artist in town. And so, um, yeah, I was, you know, I, I, got a, I got a tattoo of a Carlisle on my arm. And then uh, cooler, cooler than, you know, your average guy that just does the tattoo. I have everything that... You know, people know me as around my torch, and so I've got this little tiki guy I made for years. I have a whale with a with a baby that's a piece of glass that I make. I've got a few jellyfish by the torch. I have a wiener dog by the torch, a seahorse, and so yeah, I've got a little Sherlock, and I just keep going. I've got a 
I've got a light bulb because of the light bulb machine on my neck. I've got a 33 uh, on the top of my neck for the end of prohibition and 33 being the molecular you know, description for our glass, mm-hmm. the coefficiency. And then um, I actually have, and dude, this is the this is cool as fucking shit when you see this. I've got the book cover that Mente Alves did on my left arm. And uh, yeah, the guy that did it. So yeah, I, I mean, good question for a guy like me. Yeah, I have, I have about fucking... 15 glass tattoos hell yeah <laughs> <laughs> that's killer i've got my carl out on my arm too as well okay yeah so I understand. yeah well and that's the thing you know you being you and that's what i did i thought dude what a great way i can make like a fucking sleeve i'm gonna put everything around my torch that meant something to me that's a great idea you know yeah yeah and i just i yeah i love it I yep. just absolutely love it. I have a whole space. Uh, my left sleeve is a space scene, and I've got my Carlisle like a rocket ship, and the uh, flames are actually coming out of the back ports, like where your oxygen and propane go into. But the okay. uh, um, and it's got a little dome on top of it, little alien sitting inside of it, and then it's like the the way the artist did the the background of space. It looks like he's breaking through space, but it's like kind of glassy looking. Like it's kind of okay. like going through this universe of glass in a sense. And then it goes into a black hole in my underarm. It's all kind of tied together. Dude, fuck yeah. That sounds cool as shit. You still rocking the same Carlisle like you've had since day one? You know what? I I uh I have a I have a I have five Carlisle. So yeah, but but I still rock the one that, that I got from the beginning. But um I've got, I, I actually literally just bought all those Carlisles for through the years, not just recently, mm-hmm. but through the years, I would buy one for my dad or my brother or my nephew or somebody. Right now I have four of them being used, which is me, my younger brother, my wife, who's been blowing glass with me for the last year, making all my prep work and does a really great job. Awesome. And then uh, I have a young apprentice who's been with me for about four years. And then uh, I had another guy that was with me for about eight years, and he he kind of works from home. But they all help me out, and uh, and that and and yeah, that's also how I'm able. You know, I don't make every single piece. Sometimes I mean, I always always finish something on the piece if it's going to a store. I don't have people making stuff for me, but. Let's say I have uh, two guys who make, sh- you know, it's, and this is good for you to know right now, but um, I have two guys that just make shot glass blanks for me all day. And cool. then I I make them into whatever I want. And I uh, found out it's 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 a lot like making, you know, productions for the pipe industry when there's a guy that makes pipes and then there's a guy that draws the frogs on them. Yeah, exactly. You know, and yeah. so, so yeah, it's, it's worked really good for me. And so that's how I'm able to to really make, you know, 40 shot glasses a day. 30, 40 shot glasses a day, full monsters, full worked out, you know, or, or whatever. Badass. So, yeah, dude, I love it. That's yeah, smart. So the last question I'd like to ask is, uh, what are your five favorite tools besides your glasses and your torch? Uh, my favorite tool of all time, the knife, the butter knife, or I use a pocket knife quite a bit. And then I love to have my reamer, which is a brass reamer. I use that for poking and then for holes or loops or whatever and then of course i gotta have a ball grabber i use that quite a bit for my shot glasses and then i like to have a graphite pad and a graphite paddle i think uh Mm -hmm. you know but but really the only thing i actually need is is a is a knife i don't really need anything else if worse came to worse if i just have a knife i can literally make just about anything you ever use a spoon and I, I don't, you know what? I was wrong. Take, take off the paddle, take off the graphite pad. I was wrong. So the spoon is one of my, my, probably my second favorite next to the knife because mm-hmm. I like the curvature, um, underneath a piece yeah, a exactly. lot. Yeah. Get that combat and shape. Then, yeah. And then if you, if you see on some of the shot glasses that I make, one of the things that I like to do is I like to carve into the puck on the bottom to promote you know, the history of the shot glass, which is the pucks were often cold cut. They would cut them, you know, but 
but using a using a, a knife or a spoon to cut them while you're working them while they're hot promotes uh, that image of the history of the shot glass. If you, if you go on Facebook again or you're on there for a second and you do see that, you'll see what I mean. Cool. Yeah, yeah, I sure will. And I'll post links in the in the show notes for the all your stuff as well for that. Yeah, and I can I can send some stuff over tomorrow or the next day or something okay. if you want. Yeah, yeah, that'd be killer. Hell yeah. Yeah, man. And uh, yeah, dude, fucking A. And before I let you go, though, um, I do want to ask for you to give us any kind of parting piece of advice as well as where we can find you out there all out there in the social feeds and also to uh, where we can find your books. Well, you can find me on Facebook uh, at Eli Mize, and then you can do the same thing on Instagram at Eli Mize. You can get the book from ABR Imagery to Glass Craft. Um, it's, you can also find the contemporary shot glass on the internet, or you can just, a lot of times people will just get it directly from me on Facebook. That seems to be a good outlet for me. And then, um, a word of advice to people that are blowing glass. You know, one thing that I did, um, you know, we talk about all these dreams and all these things we want to do. I think maybe the most important thing that I learned in glass is was was to dream. Hmm. And so I'd say that, you know, don't dream while you're asleep and dream while you're awake. You can you can change the dream. You can you can switch over to another dream. You can control the dream while you're awake and look at a crystal ball while you're doing it and really get the book The Secret and manifest your life because it's the whole reason that uh, someday you'll see that maybe I get signed to do the biggest casino in the world for $57 million to make every shot glass for uh, the Mandalay Bay. Yeah. You know, or whatever. That's yeah. what they paid Dale Chihuly to make a bunch of flowers, mm. you right. know? And so I have a feeling they might pay me something like that to do a shot glass. And that's that's not something that, that I say as far as like, oh, I got to have that. But I'm just saying those kinds of dreams do happen if you if you put enough time into them. And so so, yeah, I guess the dream factor would be my my best advice was to, to be creative in in, in your mind and, and, and try to try to bring yourself a better life through a vision. Hell yeah. Well said. Yeah, that's killer. Yeah. Cool, man. Well, I hope you all enjoyed our conversation with Eli and definitely go check out his book and all this stuff coming out. It's going to be amazing. And we will be uh, keeping you all in touch with, uh, with the new release of the new book and also we can find his uh, documentary that's going to be coming out here at some point. And uh, I'll keep you abreast as well as my shot glass getting made for this book, dude. And again, I appreciate the opportunity for that. That's fucking killer, man. Yeah, man. I'm stoked, dude. I'm so stoked to get you in. I mean, your work is, you know, top notch and, and, and your professionalism and and I think that, uh, you know, a lot of us have all these other qualities that we bring to the table. Like, you know, I'm really proud of you for, for being able to do this, uh, interview. And, and, uh, when I saw you, you know, coming on here to do this radio show, you know, I don't know if it was a few years ago or whatever. I mean, yeah, I mean, let's get real, man. You know, people inspire each other. And, uh, yeah, you were, you were an inspiration on, a, on, you know, just, just another inspiration like a lot of people are. But, um, I mean, I definitely thought about, uh, uh, immediately. I mean, like I said, I'm not going to hold nothing back. I'm pretty much real talk when I talk to somebody. I, I mean, and I, I, I hate to bite too, but I said, man, dude, I'd like to do a little blog like that. And I, and that's just real. It's fun. Well, so, dude, there's been other ones that have tried it, and uh, it shit ain't easy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Oh shit, man. No, 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 no. I, I, but I, I, but I appreciate I, what you're saying though, because I'm, I, I that's no. what, that's what sparked my interest was listening to other shows. I'm like, damn, I would love to do that and talk about glass. Yeah. How can I do this? Yeah. You know. So I, yeah. I totally appreciate it. And like we talked about pre-show, I definitely want to talk about that more in the future because I think that's a uh, something that we could definitely uh, make happen and would be yeah. super oh, exciting, yeah. dude. And you know the. The further I get along on this other documentary, like I said, that I, I mean, and I know you talked about it a little bit, but I mean, it, it's a little, it's a little bit about, uh, uh, you know, I'll, I'll just tell you real quick. It's a pipe doc documentary here in Eugene okay. and it's, it, it's inspired same thing off of, 
you know, the history of Eugene and Bob Snodgrass and cool. Bob Snodgrass is in it, you know, and, and, it, and it's a story of Bob Snodgrass and from Bob Snodgrass to JBD and how, how some of this like trickle effect happened in Eugene. And then, yeah, it's about Eugene glassblowers and I'm living, I live right here in a I was born and raised in Eugene. And so all my friends worked at JBD and, and so it's a story about Eugene really more than just a pipe, but it's this contemporary pipe thing, you know? Yeah, yeah. So, cool. I'm, so yeah, that's I mean, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm really excited about it, man. I mean, we just got work, started working on it, like, you know, started actually working on it in the last just couple weeks of really seeing like, this is a real thing. So, so yeah, I'm excited about it. And I, I'd hope that, yeah, I'm sure that eventually we'll have to hook up and, and, and do that. And then, yeah, uh, yeah. You know, keeping keep me and you keep in contact because of because of the book and stuff. So yeah, we'll we'll definitely be building a relationship. So I'm I'm pretty excited about you know just us meeting and being able to communicate on here and uh, being able to work with each other. Yeah, likewise, man. That's why I love this medium because I don't get a chance to get out that much and have an opportunity to meet yourself and other artists I've looked up to. I've looked up to your work bro, for a long fucking time. So I appreciate you coming on here and taking your time out of your day and. Sharing this yeah. this crazy story because I fucking love history and I know a lot of people listening to the show and, and you know internationally love history especially when it comes to glass so thanks again yeah dude. appreciate oh, you yeah thank you man Jason I really yeah. appreciate it hell yeah and uh, hang on real quick I'm gonna say we'll say a, uh, goodbyes off the air too when I get, hit end here so hold on one second I'm gonna do my little outro real quick okay yeah so hold on so uh, yeah I hope you all enjoy this episode with Eli. Episode 177, which I can't fucking believe, 177 episodes, dude. <laughs> it's cooking. It's mind blowing. Yeah, it's crazy. So fuck yeah, Jesus. So until next time, thanks again for tuning in, and we'll see you next time on the Wise Guy Radio Show. Y'all be good out there. Keep yourself hydrated. Happy melting. Love you. Bye bye. This episode of the Wise Guy Radio Show is brought to you by The Flow Magazine. Since its inception, the focus of The Flow has been to provide a bond among members of the lamp working community. And every issue, you can enjoy great content with the hottest artists and cutting-edge techniques using the latest industry products. These features, along with the continuation of our Women in Glass edition, Glass Craft Immersion Artist Awards, inspiring gallery showcases, dynamic general interest articles, as well as health and safety information, make The Flow the leading international lampworking journal. For more information or to subscribe to The Flow, go to theflowmagazine.com. That's theflowmagazine.com.